Greetings, everyone. This is uh, Nonviolence in the News, the news segment of Peace Paradigm Radio for the first week of October, which, of course, involves October 2nd, which is Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. Uh, as for resources, uh, I'd like to mention first that the Peace Science Digest, an online journal, has got a new issue on peace education, and it calls for, quote, a complete paradigm shift in education. And behind this uh, online resource is the War Prevention Initiative. Similarly titled, the War Resistance International is now raising funds to develop a new website that's called the Nonviolent Resistance Manual. And that's going to incorporate knowledge of activists from around the world, covering a wide range of issues. And the Nonviolent Resistance Manual will help activists share ideas, tactics, and strategies to make their campaigns more effective and more sustainable. I'm particularly excited about this because I see learning among nonviolent campaigns and movements as one of the big qualitative breakthroughs that's happening in our time. I'd also like to mention our new book, Gandhi Searches for Truth, a Spiritual Biography, a Practical Biography for Children by our own Stephanie Van Hook, available through us at the Meta Center and on Amazon. Now, as for the news, there is a lot to mention, and I want to focus on one domestic and one international event that is going on. But first, I'd like to report happily that the Campaign for Nonviolence just wrapped up their week of national, nationwide and international nonviolent events, and they had 725 events this, this year which is close to double last year's numbers, it's getting to be a very significant force. And I'm also particularly pleased that they have a program called 1000 Trainings. Now, the domestic episode that I'd like to focus on with us today is what's going on in North Dakota, the Standing Rock, or as the Native American people themselves call it, the Sacred Stone uh, protest. Uh, they have changed their name, as you know, from protesters to protectors. They are calling themselves peaceful, unarmed protectors. What they're trying to block is the Dakota Access Pipeline. Many issues are involved here because uh, this is climate change. If all of the oil that's going to go through that pipeline actually happens, it will be the equivalent of 23 new coal-fired plants coming online every year in terms of increasing the carbon, which is already at the critical limit of 440 points, parts per million. So there's that issue. There's also the clash of civilizations, in effect, that's going on because the corporate interests have already bulldozed sacred sites, which is against the law in North Dakota and uh, they are basically violating tr treaty rights for that particular brand, branch of Sioux Indians uh, whose territory they have come near, up there near Bismarck. In fact, some of them are saying that the racial reality here could be a second wounded knee. Now, what's happening is that, quote, the authorities are getting more and more desperate and will test the prayerful reality of the camps. The Native American people are trying to conduct their movement entirely on a basis of prayer and ceremony, never having weapons with them, and go, but they do go and block construction on the sites, and they have been known to spray paint bulldozers and do a little bit of what you might call property destruction. So I want to, I want to isolate two elements here. The, Action has gotten really very nasty. Attack dogs, pepper spray, highly militarized police. Uh, 24 people were arrested a couple of days ago. I want to highlight the fact that the authorities are growing more and more desperate. This is a clue. This is an entry point for nonviolent actors to reassure the authorities that they are not being offered any harm. That could be difficult because the authorities are paranoid. They're looking at uh, sacred equipment that the Native people have and calling it pipe bombs. 
and so on and so forth. A lot could be done in the way of rumor abatement and calming, communicating with the opponent, the adversary. Now, I also have the strong feeling that we are coming up to what's called a nonviolent moment where the prayerful reality, unquote, of the camps is going to face off against the armed force of the corporate opposition. And uh, normally, if you really want to bring things to this kind of climax, if you're strong and you know what you're doing and the timing is right, a nonviolent moment could be that breaking point. The SALT campaign, in particular, the attack on the Darsan assault pans after Gandhi had mobilized people to make their own salt illegally in the spring of 1930 in India was their nonviolent movement and it was the climax of the freedom struggle and it led to freedom some 15 or 16 years down the road. Now, often again, a third item is that in nonviolent movements, if they are nonviolent or to the extent that they're nonviolent, Good comes out of evil. Things that look like they are setbacks often become the generation points for a new development. And a very exciting new development is happening here, in fact, as we speak. And that is that three groups that practice what's now called unarmed civilian protection, namely nonviolent peace force, which usually operates cross-border internationally, Witness for Peace, which does both, and Peace Brigades International, that does both, are starting to coordinate an approach to help the nonviolent protesters with presence, with a degree of security, and training. So uh, this is, I think, the first time that several of the 12 organizations worldwide that do unarmed civilian peacekeeping are coordinating their efforts and converging on a particularly critical campaign to see what they can do there. And I really, really like that because it means that the uh, Shanti Sena network or a worldwide network of intervention groups able to support one another with different resources, training, uh, and of course, uh, media outreach could come into being. And I believe that would enhance their power. Well, there's one more domestic event I'd like to mention that takes place in Kentucky, where the Sisters of Loreto have succeeded in blocking a pipeline, in this case, the Bluegrass Pipeline. Uh, the, t the article that describes it is called Fierce Contemplation, the Nature-Loving Nuns Who Stopped a Pipeline. Uh, this was reported in Yes Magazine, and a nice little episode there was how a company representative asked the police to arrest the sisters for disrupting their meeting that day. But the police officers, it turns out, were graduates of the local Catholic schools, and they refused to arrest their former teachers. Well, to move on now to international scene, uh, I want to report to you two things. One, a small event, but very timely. There are now about 450 jail inmates in the state of Maharashtra in North India, and 90 surrendered Maoists in the area of Chhattisgarh, which has been on occasion very violent. And they're being joined by, if I get this number right, 100,700 students who are writing annual Gandhi peace exams to mark the 147th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. I mention that because it's been shown that on exposure to some of Gandhi's writings and a serious engagement with it, which I expect happens when you have to take an exam, uh, it often changes people's consciousness. And anyway, any kind of education is always helpful for incarcerated people. It raises their self-image, gives them prestige, dignity, a different thing to do with their energies. It's always tremendously hopeful. But okay, now on to our international event. It's the Women's Boat to Gaza. It left Sicily on the 27th of September, the city of Messina, for the dangerous final leg of their voyage to Gaza, which uh, they should be reaching any time today or tomorrow, except it's not a they anymore. The Amal, which means hope, 
uh, had, had, has had to return to port because of engine trouble. So the remaining boat is the Zaytuna Olivia, Zaytuna meaning olive in uh, Arabic. Uh, their point is the, on the Zaytuna that collective punishment is illegal under international law and under the Geneva Convention. And the blockade of Gaza is exactly a form of collective punishment. So this is, I think, the fifth attempt to break that blockade by sea. Uh, the previous, one of the previous ones, as we know, ended with violence. Nine people were killed when Israeli, uh, I don't remember what part of the military they were, uh, parachuted, uh, or rather, uh, upsiled. You know, they roped themselves from helicopters down onto the uh, um, Marmara, and a, a gunfight developed, and nine people were killed. But this boat is populated entirely now by women, sailed by women, captained by a woman, and the uh, married Corrigan says she's a Nobel laureate. She says we believe it is very possible that the Israelis will try to attack the boat again, because they did every single time we sent a boat to break the siege. They attacked it, hijacked it, stole everything on board, kidnapped people, and behaved like pirates on the high seas. But their sense of justice and their consciousness, consciences as human beings are such that they cannot risk doing nothing on the one hand, but on the other hand, to attack a shipload full of women is not a comfortable situation for them that could lead to very bo bad publicity. So, in effect, they have been caught in what is called a dilemma action, where they're going to be uh, in a certain amount, of, it's going to be a certain amount of a setback for them, whatever they do. And dilemma actions are something that you do want to do every now and then in a nonviolence campaign. So, uh, the people on board are kind of impressive. It's a Nobel laureate, uh, a former military person, Colonel Anne Wright, and uh, a number of others, and uh, what they're saying is, if, if Anne Wright is saying, if I don't show up in a few days, it means that I've been, the boat has been taken to Ashdod as usual, and I've been arrested somewhere, so please try and find out what happened to me. Yeah, to be a little more precise, a Nobel Prize laureate, three parliamentarians, a decorated U.S. diplomat, that's Anne Wright, journalists, an Olympic athlete, and a physician. And Anne Wright is saying to start checking with our State Department around October 5th to find out if she's in, Israeli, in an Israeli prison and, uh, and if they don't know about it. So let's be watching very carefully for the events. This is, in a sense, a symbolic act in the, case, in the sense that the people know that they probably will not be allowed to reach port. But on the other hand, uh, it is quite concrete. They're in a real boat going to a real place with real supplies. And as I say, it's an example of a dilemma action. It's also an example, I would say, of firmeza permanente, uh, of determination, and returning again and again uh, to see where you can reach a weak point and break through. So that is the news for this episode of Peace Paradigm Radio. And if Stephanie were doing this report, she would say, and I'm repeating now, until next time, friends, take care of one another. Remember to celebrate Gandhi's birthday with prayer, contemplation, and nonviolent practice. Thanks very much. Till next time.